Hello, this is Dr. Raina Manuel Perez. I'm um, happy to spend a little bit of time with you exploring this question, what do women want? I hope you'll find it interesting. Um, and certainly I hope to illuminate how relevant it is not only to the past history, but even to our present day. And I also want to give a shout out to Dr. Greg Solyer, president of the Philosophical Research Society and to his vice president, Kelly Carmina, for hosting me again. And I really, really appreciate it. So this is it. What do women want? Let's begin together. And we'll explore both, as I mentioned, an ancient tale and how it reflects back and illuminate the present. So what is it? Power, money, family, and all of those things are great questions. And actually, I found these questions and uh, one of those headlines from Vanity Fair just after I started researching this paper, which I thought was a nice synchronicity. But in this case, this was about the roles Laura Dern, the actress, was playing uh, from her HBO series Enlightened to Big Little Lies to her Oscar winning performance in Marriage Story. <clears throat> in all those roles, there is a sense that the woman, no matter how she strives to be independent and powerful, is a victim of societal and cultural demands that picture vulnerability as a mental illness and disallows for intuitive wisdom. Instead, the woman acts according to outer demands and substitute desires, reflecting a superficial quest and covering up the true heart's desire. I think this is a struggle for all those who live this American nightmare of the war between a soulful longing and the codified perception and manipulation of desire. And then a week later, I was driving down the street in West Los Angeles and I saw this big sign, one of those commercial signs. And it said, God is a woman. Very simple and to the point. And again, what is it that women want? Is it really power, money, family? Or is there a deep current that underlies all of those things and more and that drive women? And of course, is there really an answer to this question? So on this journey together, we're gonna to look at what women are saying today about what they want and then we'll go all the way back to the Middle Ages and perhaps discover an ancient story that brings some understanding, some maybe new revelation about today's struggles with this question. And in a recent article in the New Yorker, this is what one woman says about this subject. We want community, community control. We want an end to this war against black people. And we want to value our love of people over property. She knows exactly what she wants. This is what safety looks like to her. More social workers, more funds for schools, job programs for the youth, less police, more community involvement. Then she says, and I'm quoting, this is really just the baseline of what we know we need, not just what we know we want. Because what she wants 
is for the damage to be repaired, for trauma to stop so it can begin to heal, to have a life of dignity, the possibility to thrive. This is what I gave you is just a, a short excerpt from an interview with the New Yorker journalist, Isaac Chadener, and the woman interviewed is Opal Tometi. And she wants real justice, not just white justice. And together with two other women, Alicia Garza and Patrice Can Colors, Tometi founded the Black Lives Matter movement in 2013 in response to the Trayvon Martin's murder. She is the daughter <clears throat> of Nigerian immigrants. Uh, she's received many honors with, along with her co-founders. Uh, I'm just going to name a couple of them. She was awarded the Lutelier Moffitt Human Rights Award in 2017. In 2018, Tometi was named one of 200 leaders who embody the work of Frederick Douglass. In 2019, along with co-authors and co-founders, Alicia Garza and Patrice Can Colors, Tometi received a Penn Literary Award for their book, When They Call You a Terrorist, a Black Lives Matter Memoir. Um, this was actually written in response to their critics who accused them of being terrorists. I want to say a couple more words about um, the other co-founders. Patrice Colors is an American artist and activist, and she's an, act, um, an advocate of prison abolition in Los Angeles. She teaches at Otis College of Art and Design and also at Prescott College in the master's program in social justice and community organizing. Um, Colors was forced from her home at 16 years old when she revealed to her parents that she was queer. She ended up letting go of her childhood religion of, as a Jehovah's Witness and turned toward the Nigerian religious traditions of Ifa, which is both a religious system of Yoruba, basically, and a method of divination. And she incorporates its rituals into political protest events. Um, I'm, I'm sharing this because of what she told an interviewer. She said for her, seeking spirituality had a lot to do with trying to seek understanding about her conditions, how these conditions shape her everyday life. And then she says, and I'm quoting, I understand them as part of a larger fight, a fight for my life. The third co-founder is Alicia Garza, and she grew up in Oakland in a mixed race household with a Jewish father and a black mother. And I found that personally interesting because I grew up with a Jewish father and a Dominican mother with white, black, and Taino ancestry. Garza is credited with inspiring the slogan that started the, the movement. Um, after George Zimmerman was acquitted for the murder of Trayvon Martin, she posted on Facebook, Black people, I love you, I love us. And that was the inspiration. She led the 2015 Freedom Ride to Ferguson and that's when everything started. Um, all the chapters of the Black Lives Matter movement in, in you know, all across the states and, and around the world. And Garza is, is credited in, in huge part with popularizing the use of social media to, uh, for mass mobilization. And, and this practice has been used by other movements, including the Me Too movement. Garza's advocacy style 
works outside of the existing power structures. So they reject traditional tactics and avoid making connections and compromises with politicians. Within the group, the power structure is different than most. The group puts those with the most marginalized identities in leadership positions. This to me embodies a feminine approach to leadership and is the opposite of white male relationship to power. And the group also created initiatives that give bail money to black mothers who can't afford it. We know, of course, that women um, going into the streets to fight for their rights is not new. And it's not surprising to me that women would be at the helm of the Black Lives Matter movement. And you, when you think about it, women were considered property for centuries. Women were slaves in their own household, married to men who owned them, body and soul. Being without rights is part of women's societal and cultural legacy. So if we go back through history, we see when women start speaking up. And in the early 70s is one of those times when women took to the streets and decided to become the pro protagonists of their own lives instead of living through men's experience. They were called the second wave of feminism because the first wave took place uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. And that first wave concentrated, of course, on the suffrage, right? the right to vote and to own property. In an interview with um, the filmmaker Johanna Dimitrakis in the documentary Feminists, What Were They Thinking? Uh, that's the title. And you can find it on one of those online platforms. Anyway, in, the, in this particular interview, Jane Fonda makes a really interesting point. She talks about the idea that women had to be good, as in good girls. And what that implies is that women are naturally bad. And this implication has literally dictated most of the white male driven religious, political and economic systems in our country and around the world for centuries. Um, some of the other women of that 70s movement are, they seem to be a lot of artists who were involved in it. And one of them is Meredith Monk, the composer. And she remembers inviting a boy to her house and her mother telling her that she had to let the boy win all the games because girls don't win. Fortunately, Meredith didn't buy it. She really thought it was strange and unfair and she was not going to do that. And she recognized instinctively early on that the oppression of women is rooted partly in religion with the image of God as a man. Unfortunately, many of us did grow up without a voice, trying really hard to please, to fit in, to be good girls. And sometimes we need to be told, it's not your fault. We need to be told, it's not your fault that you're still sitting on your dreams or don't believe you have a right to them. Nobody believed in you. You lived in an oppressive society made in the image of a white male God that thrives on sin and punishment, that lacks compassion, and that is all about control, objectification, and power over. And that being said, um, 
Judy Chicago, another artist, incredible artist, had the unusual experience, certainly in the early 60s, oops, sorry, um, of being nurtured and supported by her father, who worked for the post office, and he was also a labor organizer and an activist. He did believe in change. And he became a victim of McCarthyism. The FBI visited Judy Chicago's house when she was six years old. <clears throat> Her father lost his job and continued to be harassed until he died when she was 13 years old. And then she had to make this choice whether she was going to believe the world out there um, about who her father was, that he was this terrible person, or was she going to believe her own experience, that her father was a man who believed in equal rights for women, who trained her in logic and encouraged her artistic aspirations. Right? Laurie Anderson is another incredible, um, visionary artist, in my opinion. And um, she wrote this surprise hit at the time in 1981 called Oh Superman. And it poetically and powerfully addresses the failure of technology and communication in American society and how it becomes a tool of destruction and through this, we see the failure of democracy. I want to play a little piece of that um, because I think it's so worthwhile. <clears throat> Here it is. Um, we'll just do a. Uh, much more than of this because it's it's nine minutes long and we can't do that um, but I highly recommend it and I actually also um, highly recommend her other piece um, which is um, from 1986 and it's called language is a virus I think it comes from uh, it was inspired by a William Burroughs quote and um, it's quite amazing. Everybody wears a face mask in that piece. It's from 1986 and it's just totally relevant. So I would highly recommend you guys um, look at it. Um, we've been living in liminality at the threshold between what has been and what is yet to come for months, several months now. And I, I talked about that in a previous lecture, but um, women have been living in liminality for most of our history. We were marginal characters in every sphere of culture from science to the arts. We were reduced to finding a way to 
express ourselves in closed environment, a kind of spatial liminality. And that basically was called women's fear, you know, like the home raising children. Um, and it was outside of the center of social and cultural life, which was the domain of men. We've had to fight for every single right, from the right to vote, to receive an education, to participate in sports, in the political and economic life of the country, to have our own checking account, to have the right to make our own decisions about our own bodies. And we're still fighting for what we want. Being an artist, a poet, a writer was a way to express our voice as a woman while still being part of society, but it was still another marginal place. And going further back into history, I wanted to talk about um, an interesting artist who found a way to express herself within the constraints of 19th century French bourgeoisie. And she was an, uh, an impressionist painter. And uh, <clears throat> her name was Berthe Morisot. She is. In the Connecticut Review, Emily Sitzia, in her article, Women on the Edge, speaks to the fact that Beth Morizo never publicly called herself an artist. And, and yet her work is this rich depiction of women's lives in liminal places. And it reflects this ro tight rope. Morizo herself walked being an artist as well as an a wife and a mother. You'll notice the women in her paintings sit at the threshold between indoor and outdoor, right? Um, like at a balcony or at a window in a chair. They stand on the edge. And yet Beth Moiso managed to portray this life of women by bringing the liminality of women's roles to the center. It's a beautiful attempt at bringing the marginalized into the cultural conversation. And you can see this also reflected in contemporary images as well, where women are still pushed into liminal spaces at the edge especially in fundamentalist communities. Um, here, this is an image from, from a, a series called Unorthodox, also on an online platform. And I find it really uncanny in its evocative similarity in, to the paintings of uh, Beth Morizo, but that, that's just me. In fairy tales, in legends, women's roles are often one of liminality. They end up in the woods, like the handless maiden from the grim fairy tale, or sleep, like Sleeping Beauty. They're dressed in rags, covered in soot or donkey skin, or cursed in some way. They all show a facet of this mysterious reflection of the state of the feminine in our culture. And we can engage this mystery in the story of the wedding of Dame Ragnell and Sir Gawain. <clears throat> this story is one of the more popular ones from late medieval England. It was probably written by Geoffrey Chaucer. I actually wrote about it first for the Joseph Campbell Foundation, their Myth Blast series in January. You can look it up. I think it was January 19th if you're interested. So in the story, King Arthur gets separated from his knights while hunting and he meets Sir Gomer Somajur, who tells Arthur that he wronged him by giving his lands away to Sir Gawain. And Sir Gawain is one of Arthur's most beloved knights. And Sir Gomer wants to kill him. 
but he's convinced not to do so because Arthur is not dressed for battle and you have to respect the laws of chivalry. So <clears throat> instead, he makes Arthur swear an oath to return in a year from now with the answer to the question or the riddle, what do women desire most? And this is a question that's been um, asked in many different ways. Uh, you see it 700 years later, asked by Freud. So it's definitely a question that's been on men's mind for a long time. In our story, if Arthur doesn't come up with the correct answer, he will lose his life. Sir Gomer will chop off his head. So it's pretty important. He returns to court and he shares Arthur and he shares his plight with Sir Gawain, his favorite knight. And Sir Gawain says, don't worry about it. We're gonna go on a quest together. We're gonna to take this big book and ask every woman we encounter and write down all the answers. And by the end of the year, I'm sure we'll come up with the correct answer. And so that's what they do. They go gather all these answers and write them all down in the big book. And then after 11 months, they return to court. Mm -hmm. But they come to realize that they probably don't have the correct answer because they're all kind of a little bit superficial or too easy or too obvious. You know, women desire to be beautiful. Women want beautiful things. Women want a man who loves them, etc. So the hour of meeting his fate is coming up pretty soon. And King Arthur decides to go back into the woods to kind of gather his thoughts and think about things. His death. And he happens upon the ugliest woman he's ever seen, if you can even call her. She's huge. She's got this huge pendulous breast and she has this huge nose and warts everywhere and the tusks protruding from her lips. She's, she's monstrous looking. And on the other hand, she's dressed like royalty and riding a horse that's beautifully outfitted, like, you know, also like a destrier that belongs to a queen or something. So there's definitely mystery there and a sense of power. And she tells Arthur that not only does she know his plight, but also the real answer to save his life. And in return, She's only asking for Sir Gawain in marriage. Of course, Sir Gawain being Arthur's best knight. So Arthur considers this and she, he asks her name. If they're going to do this, he wants to at least know who she is. And she gives it to him. She introduces herself as Dame Ragnell. And he decides to believe her. It's just so outlandish and so strange that it must be true. But then he says that he can only tell Gawain about this. He, he won't force him to commit to such a marriage. And Dame Ragnell agrees to that. She's content with the arrangement and tells him to meet her at the same spot on the day of his meeting with Sir Gawain. Women who have any kind of power, emotional, physical, political, tend to be seen as a threat. And that's not new. From medieval times to present day, they are seen as witches. And Dame Ragnell certainly looks the part. Um, this is... Um, let me show you one depiction, one painting depiction of Dame Ragnell. 
here it is. <laughs> In 2016, when Hillary Clinton was running for president, I looked online through some of the hate talk about her, and 99% of it referred to her as the witch. It doesn't matter if you're good. It doesn't matter if you do service, if you're nice, or try to look unthreatening. It doesn't matter if you're so good, you're practically perfect. If some powerful man doesn't want to see you that way or doesn't feel like giving you the benefit of the doubt for any reason about anything, you will be vilified or abused or turned into an object. Anyway, going back to our story, Arthur returns to court and confesses to Gawain that he ran into the ugliest hag who told him she had the answer that would save his life. But she would marry a great knight in return for the favor. Notice also does not specify that the lady actually wants Gawain. But of course, Gawain, who is renowned for his chivalry, volunteers for the job. And despite his misgivings, Arthur is secretly greatly relieved. On the fateful day, Arthur rides out and meets with Dame Ragnell at the same place. And she tells him the real answer to this question, what do women want? And this is what she says. First, we want to be seen in our essence, in our innocent hearts as who we truly are. Second, what we desire most is sovereignty over our own lives. There you have it. The word sovereignty comes from sovereign, a ruler, a king or queen. And it also has to do with currency. Sovereignty is synonymous with dominion, authority, power, autonomy, self-government, freedom, self-determination. Sovereignty is this, it's like this umbrella word that is connected to this deep sense of inner authority as opposed to some external power controlling any aspect of our lives. The actual definition of sovereignty is, and I quote, the full right and power of a governing body over itself without any interference from outside sources or bodies. The other part of this riddle is evoked in the phrase innocent hearts, which means being seen for who we truly are in our authentic self. To be seen in our innocent hearts is to be seen through the eyes of unconditional love and compassion. This is the opposite of being seen as an object, as bad, as property. Synonyms of the adjective innocent, including blameless, not guilty, pure. It is the opposite of the religious assumption of guilt and sin. To be seen in our innocent heart, to have sovereignty over our own lives, are still things to aspire to a thousand years after L'Amour Courtois was born. The whole Me Too movement started because women experienced a lack of sovereignty over their own lives in the workplace. Women felt their job was on the line unless they complied with unwanted behavior from powerful men. They were threatened, sexually abused, raped, shamed, or dismissed if they didn't play the game. 
in the New Yorker article uh, of November, actually it was right around Thanksgiving, November 2017, uh, Stephen, Stephen Marsh broaches an important topic very much at the center of this problem and yet rarely discussed the nature of men's sexuality. And I want to quote some of what he said. <clears throat> I'm quoting him. After weeks of continuously unfolding abuse scandals, men have become quite literally unbelievable. Liberal or conservative, feminist or chauvinist, woke or benighted, young or old, found on the Fox News or the New Republic, a man's stated opinions have next to no relationship to behavior. For most of history, I'm continuing to quote him now. For most of history, we've taken for granted the implicit brutality of male sexuality. Fear of the male libido has been the subject of myth and a fairy tale from the beginning of literature, from Little Red Riding Hood to Bluebeard's Castle. What are well werewolves, if not men who regularly lose control of their bestial nature? There is a line, obviously, between desire and realization, and some cross it and some don't, but a line is there for every man. Having a public conversation about male sexual misbehavior while barely touching on the nature of men's sexuality is pointless. He then asks the following questions, and I'm quoting again. What if there is no possible reconciliation between the bright, clean ideals of gender equality and the mechanisms of human desire? How can healthy sexuality ever occur in conditions in which men and women are not equal? How are we supposed to create an equal world when male mechanisms of desire are inherently brutal? We cannot answer these questions unless we face them. If you want to be a civilized man, you have to consider what you are, pretending to be something else, some fiction you would prefer to be, cannot help. It is not morality, but culture, accepting our monstrosity, reckoning with it, that can save us if anything can, unquote. Well, um, <laughs> I'm glad this was written by a man, <clears throat> actually a man who was secure enough in himself to uh, quit his job, follow his wife to another country so she could have the job of her dreams. Um, I do want to add a few things to this article because it evokes, you know, um, the shadow side definitely of, of men's sexuality and how prevalent it is in our culture. And, and it is. I mean, when you think about it, so much of civilization was built on male sexual violence. Um, I mean, you look back at the rape of the Sabines by the men of Rome. It's been there throughout, you know, Civilization is, most of it is built on war and rape and slavery across the world for thousands of years. And it's not a new thing, but it doesn't make it a right thing. So really reckoning with it is, I think, essential. And you look at statistics from the uh, NSVRC, the um, National Sexual Violence um, Resource Center. And you see that in the last couple of years, sexual violence against women has doubled. And I'm not sure, you know, it may be because women are more prone to actually reporting those incidents than they used to be. That's possibly the answer. I don't know. 
but it's definitely there. One in five women, according to their statistics, is a victim of sexual violence. Um, and that violence is, of course, also against men, but it's predominantly against women and also against children. Like girls 12 to 18 years old, boys 10 years old or younger. So you, it's this power play against the vulnerable. And it's definitely something to reckon with. I think another point um, that I'd like to make about this, which is also something to uh, think about, is that in this country, the shadow or the demonic aspect of male sexuality was projected onto the African-American male for hundreds of years, beginning with slavery. And, and it also happened in, in, with colonized Africa as well. So for white men to reckon and struggle with the monstrous side of their sexuality, I believe is necessary and relevant to the struggle for equality and safety between men and women and for sovereignty in the lives of both men and women of all races and sexual orientation. And um, if you're interested in this, you know, there, there is not much, but a little bit of literature on the, the role that black men and women have played in the American sexual ex uh, imagination. And there's an, um, an interesting interview on NPR going back to May 2009 about this. Um, of course, there's also a positive side to the power of sexuality. If you look at it as the power of Eros. And what does Eros mean? Eros is aliveness. And the poet Audre Lorde talks about this. And she speaks to the importance of Eros as personifying creative power and harmony, and as an assertion of the life force in women. And which is that creative energy that's empowered in all aspects of our lives. And for Lord, it's essential for women to cherish our feelings and respect the hidden source of our power. Because she believes that's where true knowledge and lasting action can come from. This is a place which is rich and deep and ancient and where women must go to find voice and a more relevant God. This place is often also full of grief and anger as well as power from Inanna and Shakti to Isis and Aphrodite, all the goddesses embody the power of sexuality, fertility, as well as the power of the warrior. Poetry is the way we give name to the nameless so it can be thought, says Audre Lorde. And that makes all the more poignant Lord's admission to her silences. And she recognizes, and recognizes that those silences didn't really protect her. And, and she's aware that she shared a war against the tyrannies of silence with other women, black and white, old and young, lesbian, bisexual, straight. And she had to be dying to be confronted with death as the final silence, to come to terms with the fact that it might come really quickly and with no regard for whether she had ever spoken what needed to be said, or she had only betrayed herself into small silences. And so she, that helped her come to this place of seeing herself not only as, as a casualty or a victim, but also as a worry. This 
violent presence of death as a final silence, which propelled Lord past her fears into speaking out, illustrates the immense difficulty and pain women face in stating what they want in the world. This pain is so old. And it comes in part from the fear of not being understood or heard, but also from having been left out of centuries of history. Both um, Carolee Flinders in the book At the Root of This Longing, which is more spiritual approach maybe, and Carol Gilligan in a different voice, question um, perception, voice, psychological processes and theories in which men's experience stand for all human experience. And this is true even in the medical profession. I mean, there are theories and research that completely leave women out, their voice, their bodies, their life. And actually the healthcare profession has a long history of medical gaslighting and downplaying a patient's physical suffering as being all in their head. And such dismissals particularly affect women who are less likely to be perceived as credible witnesses to their own experience. And it's true even in, during this pandemic, when women are, who are suffering already from a long-term chronic, often um, debilitating neurological difficulties as a result of COVID-19 are not heard or taken seriously. It was a, in the Atlantic Magazine on June 4th, there was an interesting article about this and they reported on several examples, including this woman who happened to be a neuroscientist. And when she shared her symptoms with a doctor was dismissed, basically it was, she was told, oh, it must be stress. But then when a man who's also a scientist and a professor wrote about the exact same symptoms in the medical journal, then, oh, well, you know, he's a man, he has some, some kind of epistemic authority that makes his symptom much harder to be discounted. Um, actually, this reminds me also of um, Phyllis Chesler, who was an incredible woman also from that second wave of feminism. And she wrote um, the book, Women and Madness. And, um, and in it, she wrote about the mistreatment and misdiagnosis of women by the psychiatric institution. And the book is from 1972. I think I have a, <clears throat> a slide for that and I can show you. There it is. So Gilligan saw that in terms of psychological processes, what for men was a process of separation, for women it was a process of dissociation and it required the creation of an inner division, a psychic split. And you can see this inner division manifested in our story of Dame Ragnell in the curse of her ugliness, which is all about perception, right? She's made to look ugly. She's not intrinsically ugly. She's the archetype of the other, the strange, the different, not quite human. And at the same time, there's this sense of her nobility that comes through. And it's perceptible, perceptible in the way she carries herself, in her clothes, in, in her horse. And you find out actually later that she, she's been cursed by her own family. And isn't that where curses often begin in our own family histories, right? There's this abuse and oppression and power over the weak and the vulnerable. So the movement of women to find um, their authentic voice in the world 
I think has huge impact or could have a huge impact on the way our society functions. And I believe it's essential to the narrative of activism and change. And I don't think you can have civil rights, meaning a civil society without women's rights. Okay, let's go back to our story. Sir Gomez Sommer loses the right to kill Arthur since Dame Ragnell gave this truthful answer. And Sir Gomer is really upset about this. There you have it. She saved his life. Um, this is kind of a interesting reversal on the story of the damsel in distress. And yet we don't have, you know, a hero or a goddess with, you know, someone with great skill and magical tools. What we have is a woman with heart-centered intelligence, intelligence and truth. So Dame Ragnall immediately rides back with Arthur to claim her prize, Gawain, as her husband. And a couple of interesting things happen. When Arthur suggests a small, quiet wedding, Dame Ragnall insists on a grand occasion so that the whole court can attend. And then when Queen Guinevere insists or suggests maybe skipping the reception altogether, Dame Ragnall insists on a grand banquet. And all get to witness her terrible appetite and her manners that resemble more that of a pig than a gentle lady. And everybody's very sorry for Gawain. Dame Ragnall is a powerful example of a woman who knows her worth, no matter what. And she takes her place as an equal with king and queen. And in that way, she actually teaches the entire court about the values of chivalry on a deeper level. So when the banquet is gone, they retire to their chamber. And as they lay together, Dame Ragnall asks for a kiss. And Gawain, who has been kind of turned away from his lady, apprehensively turns back to look at her. And he is absolutely amazed because what he's seeing is this extraordinarily beautiful woman. And he's stunned and overcome and then they make love. So a little while later, Gawain asks for an explanation what happened. And Dame Ragnell explains to him that she was cursed by her half brother, Sir Gomer, and his mother. And so, and here comes the important part. So Gawain must choose to have her beautiful by night and ugly by daylight when other men can see her or else beautiful by day and ugliest by night when it's just the two of them. So she asked him, what's more important to you, to your honor? To, to be with me in front of other people when I look beautiful or to be with me when we're just the two of us alone and then I'm beautiful. You're gonna have to choose. Which one is it? So if you are a man, what would you choose? To have your woman be beautiful in front of other people and ugly when she's alone with you? Or to have your wife, your woman be 
beautiful with you when she's alone with you and ugly for everyone else? That's the question. So what does Gawain answer? He basically feels, after pondering this riddle, that it's an impossible decision for him to make, that he really has no right to make this decision and surrenders the choice to his lady. And this is the only decision and the essence of l'amour pour toi, of courtly love. Gawain has seen Dame Ragnell in her innocence, her pure heart. And he has accepted her for who she truly is. And then he's given back to her sovereignty over her own life where it belongs. And so the curse is finally completely broken. When they end up coming out together a couple of days later, the whole court is amazed and rejoices and they have a big celebration. And the two live together for five years, during which Dame Ragnell actually gives birth to a boy who in time will become one of the fair knights of the round table. And then she leaves going to fulfill her own destiny. So the end is not quite the end. The transformation of the loathly lady from the ugliest to the fairest is a common theme in fairy tale. And you can find a resonance in the Grail quest, the story of Parsifal. And both um, authors, Chrétien de Troyes and Wolfram von Ehrenbach, describe Kundry, one of the Grail messengers, as an ugly hag. And Campbell points out in Romance of the Grail, Joseph Campbell, that her appearance is like that of the great and monstrous goddess, Kali. In the Grail story, Parsifal grows through his many encounters with the women of the Grail, from his aunt Sikune, who actually tells him his name, who he really is, to Kondriamu, uh, which means lead to love in Old French. And she's the first lady whose kingdom he saves and she teaches him about love as a spiritual marriage before a physical one. And there are many more, including réponse de choix, which means joyous answer in Old French. And she's the grail queen. And of course, Kundry, the grail messenger and this horrible hag, and she's the one who shames him in front of the court for not having enough decent human feeling in his heart to ask the question of the Fisher King. And this is what later resolves Parsifal to go on the Grail quest. The feminine is the great spiritual teacher of medieval times. The feminine is the one who reminds the hero of the importance of compassion, of his feeling value, his heart, of love, and whether she's as monstrous as Kali or as sweet as Mary. She is the one who reminds the hero to ask the one who is suffering, what ails thee? And this is the beginning of psychological inquiry and heroic compassion, because I do believe it takes courage to be compassionate. Engaging the feminine principle in our daily encounters with the world around us.
like Moana, the animated film, we must come to understand that the sacred heart of the goddess, stolen by man, must be returned to her in order to restore creativity and life to the earth and to her people. This is the beginning of change and renewal. And may we all have the courage to ask the right question and begin true dialogue. So we do not find ourselves overwhelmed by the secret allegiances of the alienated heart. To quote Arthur Miller. So I'd like to um, end our uh, time together with, um, if you want to hang in there with me for that, with a poem that I, um, I did once before, I think about a year ago, uh, when I gave my talk on the goddess and um, on the feminine specifically. And this poem is called, God is a Black Woman Writer. God is a Black Woman Writer. Her name is Maya, Tony, and Angela. God is a Black Woman Writer, Alice Walker, sister, outsider. God is a wild woman writer. Oh, 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 what a numinous power. God is a wild woman writer because pale and male is not forever. And you got to know Mirabai and Sylvia and you got to know Emily and Juna and you got to say yes and hallelujah and yes and hallelujah. And God is a wild dancer, a winter night shapeshifter, a newborn cosmic dreamer because your mother needs a prayer and anything dead coming back to life hurts because never having your own life hurts and you got to love your flesh you got to love your flesh and you got to love your hands because they won't you know they won't they would rather cut off your hands and tear out your heart if they can and sew up your lips sew up your lips and keep you silent yes keep you silent but you were not born to be a slave no 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 you were not born to be a slave not a slave to history or family bigotry or patriarchy no you were not born to be a slave and you got to say yes and hallelujah and yes and hallelujah and the way forward is with a broken heart all the way down to the wet ground of the heart because it's all about love it's always been about love your inside eyes you must trust before it all turns to dust they show you a new vision, your genius heart life mission, dancing like a maenad and praying like a nomad and gathering all the storms because you never had a home. And there is no time to rewind the trap of your embattled mind because it's never been about making sense. No, it's never been about making sense. It's always been about making self. Oh yes, it's always been about making self. God is a wild woman writer and your broken, broken, broken heart is the healer. And you gotta say yes and hallelujah. And yes, and hallelujah. Thank you, everybody. Take care.